everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. It's wonderful to see everybody. I have the pleasure of introducing our lecture and speaker this evening. So, just over a year ago, a great man brought Nicholas and I together. That great man died in 1832. His name was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, which I used to pronounce as Goethe until I met Nicholas and he told me that the German pronunciation is actually Goethe. So Goethe was a German poet. He was a playwright, a novelist, a scientist, a statesman, and a theater director, and a critic. I first discovered Goethe after reading Maggie Nelson's book, Bluets, where she intensely studies the color blue. And she reflected on it often, reciting lines from Goethe's famous work, The Theory of Colors. Luckily, I found a man who on his Tinder profile proclaimed to be a fan of Goethe. I immediately swiped right. I found out soon that Nicholas was fond of many of Goethe's works, one of them being Metamorphosis of Plants. We shared our love of philosophy and poetry of Goethe. I found out later that Nicholas's Aunt Diane, also ironically a huge Goethe admirer, passed away in December of 2019, sadly before I ever had the chance to meet him. In her final day alive, she shared with her loved ones surrounding her that the one thing she valued the most was this lecture. As a speech, debate, and theater teacher, she believed that this worldly belonging typified her profession. Not long after Nicholas and I met, we began scheming on how we too could share knowledge, passion, art, and poetry with other curious people. That is where the lectern series was born, and we actually drove to Indiana and picked this up and brought it back in the back of the CRV. As Goethe once said, one ought every day at least to hear a little song, read a good poem, see a fine picture, and if it were possible, to speak a few reasonable words. It is in that spirit that we are all gathered here together today, to further intellect, to challenge minds, and to stimulate curiosity. Tonight, your lectern speaker is Nicholas Smith. Nicholas is a certified herbalist, a naturalist, a web developer, a collage artist, a classical pianist, and a philosophy lover. Nicholas began independently studying philosophy over 20 years ago. He is fiercely independent, creatively driven, and intellectually motivated. I am proud to introduce my last Tinder match and your lectern speaker, Nicholas Smith. So I hope we don't ever sponsor Tinder. <laughs> I don't think Aunt Diane would like that. Hopefully the state vote. Right. Thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. So the purpose of this talk isn't about promoting an ideological system, but rather quite simply inspiring thought and curiosity. Thought can be considered both subjective and a collective experience. Many of my findings are empirical, and my goal or expectation for myself is to reveal my interpretations on what I have studied, ask questions, seek answers, but not to apply blanket truths to my statements. This is quite a feat for encouraged, ego-driven beings who are conscious aware. 
for many, this approach might feel unfulfilling and never ending, since defining truths provides a good resting place for our thoughts. And it's too often that the foul smelling aroma of cynicism pauses our potential and our minds begin resembling wastelands devoid of intellect, curiosity, and authenticity, haunted by daily routines, societal expectations, and limitless distractions. I will begin by reciting a willful experiment from three separate influential thinkers of different eras. The first, in his book, The Gay Science, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche posed the question, what if some day or night, a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will live once more and innumerable times more. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain, and every joy, and every thought, and sigh, and everything utter unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a god, and never have I heard anything more divine. He goes on to say, my formula for greatness in a human being is amor fati, that one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity, not merely to bear what is necessary, still less conceal it, but love it. Number two. <clears throat> Johann Wolfgang von Goethe once wrote to a friend alluding to the idea of a great soul's indestructibility. He wrote, let us continue to act until one before or after the other. We are called by the world spirit to return to the ether. May the eternally living one then not refuse to give us new activities analogous to the ones in which we have already proved ourselves below. Rudiger Sanfrensky, a biographer of Goethe, elaborated on this statement by saying, Goethe was convinced that the inner goal directedness of active natures, their entelechy, was not used up in death. If the world was as it ought to be, then an unspent entelechy should be giving a fur further field of action. Of course, not everyone could hope for such a thing. You needed to have something within you worth continuing. Three. <clears throat> While giving a lecture on authenticity, Martin Heidegger, the author of Being in Time, was asked, how we might recover authenticity in our lives. Heidegger replied that we should simply aim to spend more time in graveyards. <clears throat> so when we bifurcate these three examples of, of willful experiments, we find that they have much in common. The first is they all share a striving for and a realization of potential life while implementing willful tricks to achieve purpose, purpose and meaning. The second commonality isn't as clear in Nietzsche and Goethe, while Heidegger is quite blunt in announcing the, t the terror of death as a motivator to achieve a rebirth of consciousness or freedom of consciousness. Nietzsche and Goethe hint at the concept of reincarnation of the human spirit. Nietzsche describes living a life in an infinite loop, the eternal return, thereby always striving to overcome hope. Goethe, 
on the other hand, philosophized that continuing to use your potential up until death could reset life, a rebirth of intelligence, which would continue to uplift humanity. Both concepts are perhaps metaphorical in that in order for potential to carry on after death, the wisdom of the, of the dying individual has to be inherited. Heidegger sidesteps spiritualism while going directly to the source by saying that mortality awareness is instrumental in the process of becoming. Now, all the philosophers that I mentioned lived, lived in different epochs. Those epochs greatly influenced their approach to philosophy, but by no means does it diminish the importance of their thinking. I believe the foundation of philosophy and recreating a unity within nature rests in phenomenology. I understand this statement is somewhat of a paradox, relying on subjectivity to remove the dominant I in our current era to achieve the we. To use the analogy of speech and response for output and input, speech becomes obsolete if no input is received. For speech to be effective, response and action are required, which is the hope, expectation, and necessary output. If nothing is returned, then speech undergoes the process of negation. Similarly, this I we covet so dearly is negated and becomes obsolete without others. So as long as humans have been conscious aware, we have struggled both spiritually and scientifically to actualize it. To use Immanuel Kant's terminology, it has remained a nominal or unknowable while we still can realize it subjectively. For John Searle, it's a unification of processes in the brain and a biological phenomenon like any other. In 1936, this knowing consciousness exists led the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre to write the following principle. The mode of the existence of consciousness is for consciousness to be conscious of itself. Sartre observed consciousness as something beyond itself, yet aware of itself. To Sartre, consciousness is pure intentionality. Although he describes the ego as an object of the consciousness, these two observational experiences, the being in itself, in the world, or objectivity, and the being for itself, consciousness and subjectivity, are a unified experience. Yet Sartre, unlike Edmund Husserl, did not attach the ego to consciousness. Sartre felt doing so brought consciousness back down into the world. Consciousness had to remain an absolute, but not necessarily separate because each experience depends on the other. The unified one concept has existed in the realms of the human psyche for centuries, dating back as far as the 6th and 8th centuries CE. Specifically, the Emerald Tablet delivered by I'm going to start over on that paragraph. <laughs> so the unified one concept has existed in the realms of the human psyche for centuries, dating back as far as the 6th and 8th centuries CE. Specifically, the Emerald Tablet delivered by Tote, which influenced alchemy during its early development as it offered a set of divine commandments for unification. It was Aristotle that established a strict cosmological model dividing the subject and objective experiences, that is, spirit and matter. <clears throat> so 
So the absence of a unification within our society only adds to the absurdity of life as it overwhelms us in times of loneliness, which can bring about feelings of negation and death. While the complex sociological systems that promote the separation from the whole do it through a bastardization of the individual begetting a negative connotation of solitude. We mustn't forget the importance of thoughtful ref reflection during times of loneliness. As Goethe proclaimed, the best is the deep quiet in which I live and grow against the world and harvest what they cannot take from me by fire or sword. The problem lies in our inability to think critically through these obstacles of distraction, which have exponentially increased as humans have developed more mechanisms to digitally share information amongst one another. It seems to me that these distractions overwhelm consciousness, causing the human experience to fall into an absence of living, or non-living, as opposed to the living. This brings to mind the story of Caligula's response to a soldier broken and worn out, who came up to him in the street and begged to leave to kill himself. Caligula looked at his decrepit bearing and said with a smile, so you think you are still alive then? Many societies throughout the history of humanity have engaged in rituals to escape the drudgery of human suffering. Rituals like the Dionysian Mysteries, which evolved in the Greek and Roman era, used intoxicants and transinducing techniques through dance and music to remove inhibitions and social constraints, liberating the individual to return to a natural state. Those involved most often included men and women marginalized by society, outlaws, slaves, and non-citizens. This was a form of resurrection of consciousness after a metaphorical death of the self in the throes of instability. It was through Dionysus that they were to achieve this overcoming and return to the human spirit. We see the parallels today, though less spiritual, relying on intoxicants to numb ourselves, remaining in the state of denial in order to go on standing in line with responsible citizens, though not in essence, in a society that offers very little to promote self -trans. Historical accounts prove that many of the ancient mysteries and religions symbolized the overcoming of the ego's dominance and its avoidance of self-awareness. Losing one's inhibitions is a common practice in any ritual. Inhibitions are a direct cause of the ego's emphasis on itself due to its obsessive nature and hyper-awareness of the consciousness, thoughts, expectations, judgments of others. Without the demise of the dominating ego, which is a form of ego that is encouraged by modern technological societies, there's little chance for a rebirth of ethics. One requires a suspicious or inquisitive eye to move forward. A mind vacant of curiosity pauses the process of thoughtful reflection. Life becomes stagnant or static, subjectively. Because the ego is placed at the center of the universe, unable to see beyond the interstices of the veil sheltering its vision of the earth. Ernest Becker stated quite blunt, bluntly in his book, The Denial of Death, what does it mean to be a self-conscious animal? The idea is ludicrous if it is not monstrous. It means to know that one is food for worms. The point of this thought is influenced by the lack of relationship our by the lack of relationship our societies have with death. To die is the end of existence. We devise ways in order to escape this fear of nothingness. Whether you take the leap of faith, as Kierkegaard proposed, or you seek out immortality projects to define a legacy. 
These are all direct outcomes due to our relationship with the Entire. Even to give ourselves names when we were born is an example of legacy defining our experience. During the 18th century, the Masonic doctrine placed emphasis on the overcoming of the fear of death. They turned that terror that was handed down by the church, according to Jan Swafford, into a conviction that death is what gives life meaning and value. She went on to say, the elaborate and deeply secret Masonic initiation, initiation ceremony amounted to a symbolic death and a resurrection into wisdom. Frederick Nietzsche predicted that modern societies would ultimately become passive and nihilistic. This last man, as Nietzsche labeled him, would be unable to build and act upon a self-actualized enterprise. The last man would be the average citizen of a society in the throes of what Bernard Steigler described as an absence of a man, a time in which we no longer dream of in other words, a society composed of exhausted, weary, hopeless, depressed, and avoidant individuals. The fear of losing our personhood is perhaps the most terrifying thought when contemplating death. Our egos are pronounced. The individual is put on a pedestal. And consciousness awaits, hidden from view while we subjectively take charge as a center in an ego-driven society. Perhaps death is merely a means to an end, not the end. If we bifurcate the responses to the awareness of mortality, we can either fall into denial or accept our inevitable fate. Both denial and acceptance can lead us to a leap of faith or even immortality projects but the, the awareness of the role of death plays is, key, is a key aspect of how we respond to the world around us. Echoing Cicero, to philosophize is to practice dying. Humans are creatures of influence, and many of us are skilled in the art of rhetoric. Whether rhetoric comes from a place of uplifting the whole, or a particular group or individual, its primary purpose is swaying the consciousness of others. In Freud's terminology, persuasive speech targets the superego, the part of our consciousness that is defined by morals, ideologies, values, ethics. If we are to accept Freud's superego concept, how do we guard it from ingesting and adopting ideas that are detrimental to the whole and to ourselves? Critical thought is the first piece. For just as a weight placed on a balance must weigh it down, so the mind must yield to clear evidence. We see the adoption of ideologies in haste, a sign of immature and lackadaisical thought. And with them, we acquire a set of predefined values and morals that avoid microscopic inspection, as the need to be a part of something prevails in a, site, in a society that's gone awry. Secondly, for societies and communities to persist in unison, one must test rhetoric against certain principles. One such imperative is Immanuel Kant's Kingdom of the End. Kant states, by kingdom I understand a systematic union of different rational beings through common laws. Now, laws determine ends as regards their universal validity. Therefore, if one abstracts from the personal differences, it will be possible to think of a whole of all ends in systematic connection. A whole both of rational beings as ends in themselves and also of the particular ends which each may set for himself. He goes on to explain, 
For all rational beings stand under the law that each of them should treat himself and all others never merely as means, but always at the same time as an end in himself. To clarify, let's refer to Jeff Ellington's introduction to Kant's grounding for the metaphysics of morals. The kingdom of ends is the ideal of a moral community in which each member would act in such a way that if all other members acted in this way, then a community of free and equal members would result in which each member would, as he realizes his own purposes, also further the aims of his fellow members. In such a community, each member freely disciplines himself under the very same rules that would be prescribed by him for others. The, the result would be that each member would act as a law unto himself, but yet would co cooperate harmoniously with every other member. Influenced by Kant, Simone de Beauvoir concisely wrote, to will oneself free is to will others free. Though not infallible, universal laws that help guard and guide a thoughtful individual are necessary to any self-sustaining society. But none of this is possible without confronting the fear of death. Overcoming this fear will limit the ego's domination of consciousness, enabling our consciousness to guide us in our decisions and responses when navigating the abyss of existence and thought. As Mikel de Montaigne wrote, it is fear that I am most afraid of, and I want death to find me planting cabbages neither worrying about it or the unfinished garden. So why not we remove the default settings that hinder the art of man? Redefine what expectations are considered grandiose, and seek not what can bring us the next great satisfying experience, but rather achieve purpose and meaning by reminding ourselves, as adults, that perhaps the child, as we all once were, has the most satisfying vision of all, an unabashed curiosity of life. To conclude, I'll leave you with the following thought on life and experience by Friedrich Nietzsche in his work, Human All Too Human, a book for free spirits. life and experience. If one notices how some individuals know how to treat their experiences, their insignificant everyday experiences, so that these become a plot of ground that bears fruit three times a year, while others, and how many of them there are, are driven through the waves of the most exciting turns of fate, of the most varied currents of their time or nation, and yet always staying lightly on the surface, like prayer. Then one is finally tempted to divide mankind into a minority of those people who know how to make much out of a little, and a majority of those who know how to make a little out of much. Indeed, one meets those perverse wizards who instead of creating the world out of nothing, create nothing 